Hi, fifth grade. It's Miss Barker again from Syracuse Academy of Science and Citizenship. We are now on module one, lesson two. We are talking about strong verbs and adjectives today. Some of the vocabulary you're going to hear in our story is amiss, which is improper. Appease means to satisfy something. Um, Collots, which are shorts that resemble a skirt. All right. Given all the fuss I had made this week before, Abuela knew something was amiss when I hadn't mentioned anything else about Thanksgiving. Mio, mio que paso, with son giving, she asked. There's only five days left. I have to start cooking, no? Abuela, I whined. I don't know what to buy or how to even make anything. What are we going to do? No worry, we can have pork and black beans like we always have. Maybe some cabarani. I think that's how they pronounce it. Maybe it's cubarani. I think that's probably how it's pronounced. That's Americano enough. No, she said, genuinely trying to appease me. I guess so, Abuela, but it's not the same, I said. A spare out a minute, she said, and darted to the bedroom. She returned with the week's Liberty Mart flyer. You're a look. This will help. I, it was a special flyer with pictures, like one of the ones that's on the Ditos and full of Thanksgiving Day items on sale, including turkeys and something called stuffing in a box, which immediately caught my attention. Could it be true? Could Thanksgiving dinner be as easy to make as instant mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese? With a flyer as my guide, I made a list and Abuela calculated the cost to the penny. $27, $0.35 plus tax. She gave me $30 and off I went to on my bike to Liberty Mart, hoping Thanksgiving would be as easy, as tasty as spray cheese from a can. My favorite. The store was more crowded than I had ever seen before. The ro they roamed around for a while, or I roamed around for a while looking for stuffing, but it wasn't listed on any of the signs above the aisles. I noticed a lady wearing clots and a fancy pendant necklace like Mrs. Brady from the Brady Bunch. Surely she was American, I thought. Surely she would know all about making Thanksgiving meal. I worked up the nerve to ask her where I could find the stuffing, pointing to the picture of it on the flyer. Well, how sweet. You're helping your mother fix Thanksgiving dinner. She asked, as if I were three years old. Yes, I said, seizing the opportunity, but I don't know where to find anything. Oh, don't worry, honey, she continued. Just go to the end of the aisle at eight and have everything you'll need. It'll have everything you need. Pumpkin. Did she call me pumpkin? Why? Or did she mean they had pumpkin pie there? I was confused. Really? Even pumpkin pie, I asked? Oh, I don't know, honey. I always buy the frozen ones. It's so much easier to make from scratch, she offered. Frozen pumpkin pie, could it be that easy? Just as Mrs. Brady said, I found everything in the special Thanksgiving display at the end of the aisle. At the end of aisle eight, including the stuffing in a box. I read the instructions on the box. Boil one and a half cups of water, one fourth cup of margarine, and a medium saucepan. Stir in the contents of stuffing. Mix, pouch, cover, remove from heat. Let stand five minutes. Fluff with a fork. Just as I had hoped. Easy as mashed potatoes. Abuela saying, Cuomo, <laughs> Cuomo inventing los americanos rang truer than ever to me then there were also cans and yams at the display alongside bags of tiny marshmallows just like patrick pickleton had told me what he didn't tell me though or didn't tell me was that the instructions for candied yams were right on the marshmallow bag put mashed yams in casserole mix together margarine cinnamon brown sugar and honey top with miniature marshmallows and bake at 325 until heated through the marshmallows are bubbly even a boiler could make that one i translated for her there were also cans of something called cranberry jelly. Piled up high, jelly in a can. I wondered, none of the American kids had mentioned that, but I saw their customers tossing one or two cans into their cart, so I followed suit, figuring it was important something, important for something. All I wanted was turkey, while Abuela knew how to cook the turkey, something enormous. I worried, staring at the case full of frozen turkeys. Sure, the turkeys on Ditto's had looked big, but these were three four, five times the size of chicken. Would a boiler freak out? But I noticed the turkeys I had cooking. Instruction printed right on the wrapper. I read them over and discovered the turkey as a timer. They would pop up when it was done. Cuomo invention Los Americanos. The instructions also recommended three quarters of a pound per person. So I started counting relatives and families and friends who considered relatives anyway. Blood or no blood. Tio Marcio and bratty cousins Margaret and Adolfo. Tia's Mirta, Afuela, and Susanna. My godparents, Tios, Berto, Pepe, and Regino. The mechanic, Minervio, and his wife, although 
about 24 something guess. I estimated and figured I needed at least a 20 pounder. There was no way I could carry that on my bike all the way home with the rest of the groceries. I'd have to come back for the turkey. Considering the number of guests, I went back to display and got two more boxes of stuffing, six cans of yams, four bags of marshmallows, and three cans of cranberry jelly, whatever that was for. And then I picked up a frozen pumpkin pie, just like Mrs. Brady had. Suggested, proud as a pilgrim in 1621, I floated down the aisles with my loaded cart, ready for my first real Thanksgiving. When I got home, I set the bags down on the kitchen table and explained to Abuela that the turkey was too big and I needed to go back right away. Puero, how are you going to carry it, she asked, concerned. Your abuelo can't take you. That he's at a baseball game, and Kako, you'll have to wait until manana. But I didn't want to wait until the next day. What if they ran out of turkeys? I told abuela I'd tie the turkey to the handlebars on my bike. She thought it was over for a moment, and handed me a piece of twine from the kitchen drawer where she kept twist ties, matches, and birth cake. Birthday candles, not cake. I hopped back on my bike, darted to Liberty Mart, got my bird, and tied all 21 pounds of it across the breast onto my handlebars. But getting it home wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. When I rode over a pothole in front of St. Brent, Brendan's rectory, like I always did for the heck of it, one of the knots slipped and the frozen turkey slid off like a shuffleboard puck down the sidewalk and into the gutter before stopping inches from the catch train. No problem, I thought. It was frozen and sealed in plastic. Picked it up and tied it even tighter in a few extra knots. But while I was cutting through a parking lot, it fell again and skidded under the four-door sedan. Crouched down, tried to grab it, but it was just out of my arm's reach. Finally, I squirmed under the car on my belly and yanked it back. The turkey was emerging groomy and blotched with oil. Okay, so that's the end of that story. That's quite the interesting continuation from our story yesterday, from lesson one. So he had quite the adventure, huh? All right. So think as you read ideas. These are something that you guys should be thinking about while you're reading um, stories more than once. So. There's an example on here, and it's quote from the text. Darted to her bedroom. Idea. The word darted helps me from form a strong picture in my mind, which is like a mental image of Abuela rushing to her room. She's eager to help her grandson, okay? So we know that it tells us, kind of like gives us a mental picture of her running to her bedroom, right? It's not a prediction because they didn't say what might happen. Word, phrase, or sentence I like. So it's kind of just a quote. Okay. So now I want you to go back and I'm going to go back and just show you quickly the little reading that we did. One, two, three, four, four pages. Okay. You're going to go back and you're going to tell me a quote that you found in the text, the idea of the text. So just like up here, it tells why they use the word darted to her bedroom. It it's kind of like an idea of why they use the word. Um, a category, so is it a mental image? Is it a prediction? A word, phrase, a sentence that you liked? Confusing word, phrase, or passage? Idea that repeats itself or a context clue, okay? If you can't remember context clues, it's something that's in the story that helps you identify what the word is. Whoa, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, okay, and then you're going to do one, two, and three three, no, one, two, three, and four. So you're going to find four, four quotes. You're going to tell me what their idea is, meaning why did they use that word? The category that it falls under, so mental image, prediction, word, phrase, sentence, or confusing word, phrase, or idea that repeats, or a context clue, okay? So I would like you to at least try to do these um, on a piece of paper maybe, and take a picture of them, send them in an email or dojo, uh, whichever you prefer, I don't mind. And um, yeah, so that's the end of that one. Okay, verbs versus adjectives. Okay, this is kind of where our lesson was at. Now we're kind of getting into like a little bit of our writing stuff. The antelope ate the grass. The lion ate the antelope. What is the verb in these sentences? Okay, so what would be the verb? First of all, what is a verb? Anyone? Action. Okay, something that's happening. So, the, is that a verb? No. Antelope? No. Eight? Possibly, that's something you do. The grass? No, that's a noun. The lion ate the antelope. Well, in the same type of situation, the lion and the antelope are animals, so that's not it. And the and the, those aren't it. So it has to be eight. 
So the verb in the sentence is ate. So when you come into here and you look at a T chart, now I know you just did this on a separate piece of paper. That is fine. Use the same piece of paper on the back. You can use anything you like. Make a T chart. This is a T chart. See, it looks like a T. I'm putting antelope here and I'm putting lion here. Now I'm going to actually exit out of my PowerPoint for a minute because I want to write in here. Antelope. It wants to know give me more words that you could use using strong verbs and strong adjectives to describe antelope. Okay. So I would like how, so I'm going to explain this. So without me trying to sound like it's too much. Okay. So when I say I'm eating a bowl of cereal. Okay. When I'm saying I'm eating a piece of popcorn, I might do it quickly where I'm, if I'm eating cereal or I'm eating like something that takes a spoon or a fork, it might be a little slower. So antelope, how would they be eating the grass? If they're picture them in your brain, okay. That they're sitting in the field, they're eating the grass, they're, you know, chomping away. Are they quietly, peacefully? What are they? Okay. A verb, how are an adjective? How are they eating? Okay. Lions. Now, if a lion is eating the antelope, do you think at first they might be quiet? If you said yes, you're correct. But then do you think they're very aggressive and like really loud? I would have to say so because they're, if they're going to go to eat the antelope, the antelope is their food. So they want to catch it as quick as they can. So you need some adjectives that describe how the lion would eat and how the antelope would eat. So come up with like one or two and Think of them on your own and um, you can take a picture, you can send it to me, whatever you want to do, it's up to you. All right, so here are some examples of strong verbs. Gwen laughed at her uncle's silly jokes. Some of the answers that they looked at as um, a, a verb, so laughed, so if you use the word laugh, these are other words you can use for laugh, so giggled, chuckled rear or roared. The family talked about current events over breakfast. So talked is the word that we we'll use for our verb. So you can use chatted, argued, discussed. Dr. Halsman looked at my rash thoughtfully. So they looked. So they examined, observed, stared at. The champion horse ran around the track to win um, to win the race. So ran, I don't want to say it. So we ran around the track. So a strong verb is going to be either galloped, flew, or dashed. So if I just say, yeah, I ran to the store. Okay. Yeah, I did. But if I want to use something like strong and powerful as a word to replace ran, I would use galloped, flew, or dashed. My rude sister took the popcorn from my hand without even asking. Well, she took it. Yes, she took it. But could you kind of give a little bit more like maybe she's like snatched it or she stole it from me or she even grabbed it from me? Something like that. And then we have examples of strong adjectives. So this is describing something. So describe a cave using strong adjectives. So you would say gloomy, damp, dark, or stony. Those are any of them. There's some probably more wet maybe. Um, but these are like really good words to use for your, um, your writings. Okay. All right. That's the end of strong verbs and strong adjectives. Now look out for your, uh, your assessment. That'll be on Google forms and it'll be uploaded and you should be able to give some of your answers. So I look forward to seeing you guys. Bye.